Hi, Lloyd. Hi, Alex. Good to be with you again. It's good to be back. Today, we are discussing property management. We are indeed. One of the chapters in your book, Positively Geared Lloyd, uh, is, is the chapter devoted to uh, what you call the landlord's toolkit. Now, what what a lot of people may not realize is once you make the transition from homeowner or possibly not having owned property to a, to a property investor is that you're also a byproduct of that is that you become a landlord. Now, uh, being a landlord is is not difficult and you know you you really do spell it out in the book and give people as it's, as you've rightly called it the toolkit they need to sort of get up and running and to learn quickly. Um, but we want to talk today about all things property management related. We feel it's a very important and often overlooked part of being a property investor. Uh, as a landlord, you're going to be faced with a lot of decisions to make um, in terms of getting the right tenants in properties, uh, you know, repairs on properties and everything in between. Walk us through what the basic toolkit looks like. Uh, I think the most important thing to uh, to think about first, Alex, is the fact that it actually doesn't take a lot of time to be a landlord. Now, I always get the question, you've got so many properties, it must take so much of your time to manage your portfolio. But in essence, I spend hardly any time managing my portfolio because it's outsourced to property managers. And that's one of the things that we'll discuss uh, during this episode. Uh, but it's only when you're self-managing your properties that that's going to be taking a lot of time. And that's something I generally don't recommend. Uh, so when you're outsourcing it, then uh, it's actually being managed and and providing you're buying good properties in good locations, you've got good tenants in place with good property managers, then you very much can be a passive property investor from that perspective and you can just concentrate on growing your, your portfolio. Uh, but the actual having your tenants in there and all that is quite passive for you because you've got someone looking after that. I guess I'll go through you know, what a property manager does and, uh, and yeah, how you get good tenants and, and everything like that. But essentially, if we look at what the what property managers do, uh, their main responsibilities, they source tenants for you. Uh, they can open your property for inspections. Uh, they check whether your uh, prospective tenants are blacklisted from rental and what their histories have been like in the past. Uh, they, of course, check references um, for that. They collect rent on your behalf. So again, it's uh, passive from your perspective because uh, you're not actually having to do that yourself. And they can actually also pay your your bills, uh, which includes your council water and, and strata rates uh, where applicable uh, from your rent monies. Uh, and then, of course, um, they'll then pay the balance of your um, yeah, money to uh, to your account each month. Uh, property managers also conduct you know, routine inspections. Uh, they can organise repairs and maintenance, uh, deal with tenant concerns. And this is a really good one, is that they can actually chase overdue rent so that you're not having to do it. So again, it um, it allows you to get on with uh, just growing your portfolio and not having to worry about those little things. Lloyd, when you were sort of first starting out and or, or even you know, working towards midway of building your portfolio, what were the key things that you identified that you really started to look for in a in a managing agent? Uh, I think um, one of the uh, important things, I think, is getting a managing agent who has a property portfolio themselves because I, I think you need to have someone who's got some skin in the game that they actually understand that they're managing uh, something that's, uh, you know, your potentially your biggest asset. So uh, they, they need to really come to grips with that. The other thing that's um, very important is to also ask your your property manager, you know, how many properties they actually manage, how big their rent roll is, because you don't want someone who's completely um, overwhelmed with, you know, with managing too many properties. One of the things that sometimes people get a, bit, a little bit too concerned about is, uh, you know, how much commission they charge and everything like that. Uh, that's not solely the most important thing, trying to get the, you know, the cheapest property manager. You should be looking for, you know, the overall, you know, whether they're charging anything above uh, their commission, whether they're charging monthly uh, expenses and uh, and things like that and, and how much they charge for new leases and things. So you need to look at things overall, but you don't want trying to be cutting your property manager too much uh, in terms of what you're paying them because you actually want someone who's going to be uh, managing your uh, property well. I think over time, uh, there's a there's a few questions that I've I've learned to ask a property manager when I'm when I'm sourcing someone new, and I do try to use the same manager for properties that are in similar locations. Like if someone works across Sydney, then I'll use the same person to manage uh, those, for example. But you can't necessarily use the same person to manage properties in in Brisbane or Melbourne. So you, you do end up using a few different 
property managers. I think it's, it's very important. Other questions that I'd be asking a property manager is how many routine inspections they do with your properties each year. So you're allowed to actually have up to four um, per year, but some actually only do two. So it's good to know um, how they keep track of that and how often they are doing that. And then getting back to fees that I mentioned earlier is do they charge extra fees to organise repairs um, or, or pay rates on on your behalf. Also asking them what their actual tenant screening process is like, which is something that we'll cover a little bit later on. Uh, it's also good to ask them what action they take if the tenant doesn't pay rent, uh, because that's, that's quite important. Because um, what I found in my early days is sometimes you're dealing with an inexperienced property manager and they weren't quite on top of things. And just to add my two cents worth, Lloyd, on the topic, I'm a big advocate for using a property manager. Obviously, there are some instances where self-management is okay, and we're not here to say, don't do that. Once again, everything we discuss is really depending on the individual circumstances and needs at the time. Uh, however, what, what I've learned over the years is that you know a good quality managing agent, particularly a proactive managing agent, not only are they managing your property, but they're going to also keep up to speed with the rental market. So for example, Lloyd, you know, let's say that there's an area that becomes a real hotspot and there's increased demand for people want, you know, tenants wanting to live in that area. How good is it to have a landlord that can, excuse me, a, a managing agent that can call you up and say, Hey Lloyd, just so you know, um, you know, your, your tenant's lease is due for renewal soon. Um, by the way, here's a report of the last three months activity in the suburb. You know, we believe that you can possibly get an increase on your return. Absolutely, Alex. And that's one of the things that, uh, I like to see from my agents is actually an update every six months on what the market is actually doing. Because where possible, if you can increase your rent by yeah ten dollars every six months or something, then that's that's really good. But certainly, seeing what the market is actually doing and getting some advice from your property manager, they're the experts in the field. Quite often, you as a property investor might be wanting a certain amount for your property, uh, and then yeah, sometimes you might be asking maybe a little bit more than market value, and then wondering why it's not been rented and things. So this is where you need to get a good property manager and then take their advice on what is market value for your property. But the worst thing you can do is be renting a property for this, uh, the same amount of rent for four or five years, doing nothing about it, then finding out that you should be actually be getting $100 more a week later on than what you, uh, you, you are because you haven't increased your, your rent over time. So you actually need someone who's got their, you know, their finger on the pulse uh, from that perspective. It's so true, Lloyd. I find with a lot of self-managed um, portfolios or people who own investment properties and self-manage, that's probably the biggest commonality I find amongst them all. Typically, their properties are rented below market value. And, you know, then there's this mentality that, okay, well, the tenant's been here for a long time, so we're happy to keep them there. And look, that's fine. But that's not necessarily, once again, going back to strategy, what you need to do in order to work towards your, your longer term goal. Yeah, so I hear that a lot. The tenants are fine. They've been there. Uh, they're a good tenant and all that kind of thing. But again, it, it's you've got to run your property portfolio like it's a business. So in terms of your rent, you know, renting to a family member, for example, and, and charging them half or, or renting to someone who's uh, supposedly a, a good tenant, in inverted commas, uh, at the end of the day, you know, if you've got a good property in a good location, then you should be able to get market rent for it. And if the tenants you've got in place don't want to pay your uh, your rent, they can move out and you can get someone to move in who will pay market rent because at the end of the day, you're the one that's actually uh, missing out. Uh, on you know, on getting adequate income for your property. This is your your retirement. This is your future that you're you're looking at here. So it's very important to make sure that you actually are getting um, adequate returns from your property here, not just thinking, oh, I've got a good tenant, so I don't want to lose them. Because if it's in, if it's, as I said, if it's in a good location, you'll be, be able to rent it out well at market value. That's why it's really important that when choosing a managing agent, take the time to do your due diligence, take the time to ask the questions you've just mentioned. A great one that you raised before Lloyd was, you know, how many properties do they manage? Are you going to give your property to a, to an agency where they've got, for, for example, a thousand properties on their rent roll and they've only got two property managers? It's never going to end well. Absolutely. Yeah. And and that's happened to me. And, and getting back to your question about you know, what were some of the things I was learning when I was first starting out. And I did have a property uh, in, in Queensland once where I, I gave it to, uh, you know, a property manager. It was a, a franchise, quite a well-known brand. And, uh, but it, it worked out that they, they just had way too many 
properties on their rent roll. They had about 500 properties across, you know, three property managers and uh, the property manager managing my property was actually very young. Not that that's a, a bad thing, but there was inexperience there and uh, and they couldn't really, um, you know, cope with um, their demand. And there's a couple of uh, issues with the tenants there and they weren't really across things there. So, uh, yeah, that became a bit of a, uh, a bit of an issue. Uh, the other thing I'd probably like to mention also is that when looking for a property manager, quite often property managers are seen as sort of, uh, I guess, the poor cousins of a, of a real estate selling agent. So sometimes it's, it's good to, it's very important to, to interview property managers um, carefully, but sometimes, you know, there are specialist property managers who actually specialize in managing properties. So not always necessarily going to the, you know, the big name real estate agency who has a property management arm, which is their bread and butter, but actually going to uh, those uh, companies that actually don't sell property, but they actually just manage property because they're the ones that I find work out quite well because uh, they're not, there's no conflict of interest. They actually just manage property. That's their business. Uh, and they tend to do a really good job for you. That's very sound advice, Lloyd. One of the most important things that I've learned over my career is that where everything typically starts with in terms of setting yourself up for success, setting yourself up to not have headaches uh, or trouble down the track is getting the right tenant in the property. That's where I think a good managing agent will probably deliver the most value from the get-go. So you mentioned before, you know, how do they screen their tenants? Uh, another aspect is also, you know, where do they actually attract their tenants from? Is it a database of pre-existing clients? You know, do they have the reach to get your property on all the major web portals? Are they advertising just on social platforms? You know, it, 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 don't be afraid to ask the question, how do you source your tenants? Where do you get them from? How long have they been, have they rented previously through your company before? Dig deep, just ask all the, the important questions. Absolutely. And it's really important to to get references. So have they, uh, have they rented through your company before? But if they haven't, get references from where they've previously rented to make sure that they've actually paid their rent on time and also get some information around, uh, yeah, their income, uh, and yeah, their job security, just to, to get an understanding of, of whether they're in a secure job or whether they're just working on a casual basis, um, whether they're on, you know, on Centrelink or, or things like that. And, and all that just, um, helps you to understand their, their sources of income, uh, and whether they're going to be a, a stable tenant uh, and a good property manager, uh, should really be doing this is that when you advertise for tenants, you should get a number of applications and the property manager should actually put probably three applications through to you and you can review them and then later can advise you which one they'd recommend. Uh, you can also have a choice there, which tenant that you should put in your, your property there. Uh, I think a few of the other things to ask the tenant as well would be, uh, you know, do you plan on getting any, say, roommates in the future? You know, do you work night shifts or odd hours? Because that could potentially affect uh, your neighbours and things like that. You know, do you smoke? Is something that you could potentially ask. Yeah, if you don't want a smoker inside your property, then you've got every right to, to mention that. And I think a big one that comes up quite a lot is pets. Uh, now, personally, I actually allow pets in my rental properties because I think that actually, actually opens up to a, a wider demographic. Uh, but you can stipulate what you want. So, you know, you might just want, you know, you allow small small dogs, for example, that don't have much hair or you'll allow a cat, but you don't want big dogs. You know, you can stipulate what you want and that can be written into the lease uh, so that any damage uh, can actually be, needs to be repaired by the tenants and things. But but that's just something to, to think about so that you're not actually um, surprised by anything that pops up later on. Lloyd, one of the uh, small costs, but I prefer to use the term investment when uh, leasing a, leasing an investment property is it's your landlord's insurance. Now, there I know there are a lot of providers of this service. Uh, you know, within our company, we, we can provide our um, landlords with insurance for only a couple hundred dollars and we've seen many instances where they've actually been really grateful down the track that they've you know made that investment uh, how important is 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 it to have an insurance in place uh, well it's actually really important uh, you know for, for a few reasons uh, full landlords insurance actually c covers the insurance on your property and also insurance for loss of rent so just breaking that down for your actually actual property, so if you've got a house, for example, then you should have building insurance on it anyway. If it's in a, an apartment or a townhouse that's a, a strata building, then while you won't have necessarily building insurance, you'll have the, the strata insurance that actually cover that, then you should just have 
um, insurance that'll actually cover uh, the internal. So it'll be like land laws insurance that will cover any damage that uh, is caused inside the other uh, property. Uh, but also landlords insurance to cover uh, loss of rent potentially if the uh, you know if the tenants sort of clear out and things like that uh, and haven't paid you some rent and things like that although you're paying you've paid a bond uh, that's not really going to cover uh, everything so just having some insurance in place there is very important to just to mitigate yourself from being uh, too much out of risk again the cost of landlords insurance uh, is it pales into insignificance in terms of what it can potentially save you but again it's just a cost of doing business and having a property portfolio is business. And again, it's, it's tax deductible. And I suppose that ties in with my point earlier, which is, you know, it, once again, really important to get the right tenant in because then that minimizes the, the need for, uh, you know, uh, insurances. We're not saying not to forego insurance, but it just means that you're probably not going to have to be relying on ev just waiting for things to go wrong all the time. Yeah, that's very true, Alex. And and that comes down to, uh, you know, a few things. And I always talk about sort of buying in the in the right areas. So, you know, buying an area that's not necessarily something that's going to be attracting um, bad tenants, so to speak. But uh, there's another thing that often crops up and, and that is, you know, I often talk about buying close to, you know, universities or, or you know, in, in areas that are driven by universities. And then, you know, people sort of um, ask me about, you know, What's the student demand of this area going to be like in the future? And then I realised we're actually on two different pages here because I never think about renting my properties to students. The fact that I want to rent um, close to a uni or have a property close to a university is actually so the uh, the lecturers at the university can actually you know rent my property, not the students. So it's not about having students living in your property. You've got a nice rental property. You actually want people like uh, you know doctors, nurses, if you need the hospital or if you need the university, have the lecturers there, or if you need schools, have teachers there. Uh, so they're the type of uh, people I've got renting my properties. So again, and their quality, they're professionals. You've got teachers, police officers, doctors, nurses. Uh, you those kind of people renting your properties, uh, they're quality people. They're the kind of people that you want to have um, in your properties that will mitigate you against, uh, you know, potential damages and stuff. Every investor, Lloyd, at some point throughout their investing career will inevitably be uh, at a point where they do need to conduct repairs on a property, whether it's, you know, real minor superficial improvements or, or repairs to a property from a light fitting to a door handle. Uh what what do you recommend um, in terms of how to deal with that? I know that, for example, it's really important to have that critical conversation with your property manager and define, for example, okay, you know, this is a set amount that we're happy for you to go ahead without calling me up to get fixed. How, how do you normally handle that? Yeah, look, normally you have it in the lease where uh, you might agree to $500 or so being a set amount that they can have, uh, you know, fixed without calling you up, particularly if it's the middle of the night or it's, or it's an emergency, you need to call a plumber out or something like that. I think that's really important. If, you know, if it's a major, a major issue, uh, that's going to be a couple of thousand dollars and obviously they, uh, they should get a quote and probably, you know, I'd ask for three quotes and things like that. It's going to be a major repair like that, but you definitely need, do need to give your property manager some leeway. Uh, to be able to just get some some stuff fixed, and particularly if it's a you know a broken door handle or a leaking tap, just get someone out there. My property managers, however, still call me up and say, you know, the tenant has an issue with this. Uh, can I call um, someone out to look at it? And although it, it might only end up being a call out fee of one hundred and fifty dollars or something, uh, the property manager will still call me up and ask me about it anyway because it's the sort of relationship that I've, I've built up with the property managers. So that's that's very important. Uh, the other bit of advice that I would uh, have here is that it's very important to look after your tenants. So don't skimp on repairs. If that, something's not right in your property, make sure you fix it because you want to keep your tenants happy um, for the long term. Uh, because if something isn't right in your property, then they'll probably end up uh, wanting to move out. And then you're going to have to fix that before your next tenants move in anyway. Uh, but if you are looking after your, your tenants long term, then they'll, you know, they'll look after the place in return um, hopefully, and and they'll be good long-term tenants. And I've got some of my properties that I've had for years, and I may have only had one or two uh, changes in tenancy that whole time. So, so that's really important. I mean, I even go to the extent where I actually send Christmas cards to my tenants, um, just um, and they haven't even met me. I just send them a Christmas card, sort of just you know, from myself as the landlord, and just say you know, hope you're in. You know, Merry Christmas, hope you've enjoyed living here, and um, you know, whatever. But you know, little touches like that is is always nice as well. Absolutely. And I think just touching on repairs, something that I've also seen over the years is that, you know, it's really important as a as a landlord 
sometimes you just need to fi- fix things properly. Yeah. No band-aid effect fixes. Absolutely, yeah. And and I think that and that comes down to sometimes, you know, people want to self-manage their properties and just want to go around and sort of fix something to save costs. But I really just urge people to just treat it as a business, get professionals in there. If you are, a, a, you know, a tradesperson yourself and you can effectively do that, then by all means do that. Um, that's that's perfectly fine. It's just like some of the properties that we, we buy for clients and, um, and our client actually is a builder, then they can renovate the properties themselves then, you know, we don't need to arrange a builder for them. Uh, but, you know, if you're not an expert in that field, just uh, get, you know, get an expert in to fix it uh, because uh, that's really important. Yeah, as you say, Alex, no, no Band-Aid um, fixes. Just make sure that you fix the problem so it's not going to happen again for them. Lloyd, one of the most often misunderstood parts of being a landlord is what you can and can't claim uh, to reduce your, your taxable income. Uh, there's actually a lot of benefits being a landlord um, in terms of what you can deduct, you know, the most obvious one is management fees, for example, um, p- partially renovations to property, all of the associated costs with getting your investment property advertised and out there is all an expense, which is, is tax deductible. Are there any particular ones that you wanted to cover off on that, you know, some people that are new to investing might not be quite aware of? Yeah, so Alex, there's, there's quite a few things that we can probably just uh, cover off uh, so obviously the, uh, the property management fees, um, which is the percentage of the fees that you're paying to your uh, property management property manager, uh, are claimable, and and they're actually deductible uh, in the year that they that they occurred. Uh, you can also claim maintenance costs, but you can't claim improvements or enhancements uh, on your property. So maintenance costs are simply, uh, as we referred to before, if you need to call the plumber in, you know, you've got a broken door handle that you need. Uh, repaired, then they can be deductible in the year uh, that uh, that occurred. Uh, if you're, uh, you know, doing some uh, renovations, for example, then um, they're only claimable as um, capital works, uh, not actually in the year that uh, that they're claimed. Um, interest, however, um, is a very uh, important thing on on an investment property, which um, is obviously claimed in the uh, in the year that um, those expenses were incurred. Advertising, obviously, for tenants, uh, which is all part of the whole property manager thing, obviously, again, can be claimed um, you know, on your tax. If you've got um, body corporate fees on your property, then same thing, they can be uh, deducted in that in that year for your all your other outgoings, because of, often you know people are concerned when you've got a pr- um, yeah, investment property that you're obviously paying council rates and you're paying water rates and uh, and potentially if you've got a uh, a few properties you might be paying land tax as well, then you've got to pay those outgoings, but they're all deductible in the year that they um, are occurred as well incurred as well. Other maintenance costs, you know, if you are getting someone else to come in and look after the the property, uh, such as you know gardening and lawn mowing, uh, we can certainly get that claimed um, as on tax as well. So. Uh, quite often, uh, you know, when you've got tenants in your property, uh, they'll they'll quite often look after the gardens themselves. That there might be times where uh, you actually just arrange for someone to come in and, and look after that, or uh, might be in between tenancies, and you need to get your your property uh, maintained before the new tenants move in. Uh, in which case, you um, would need to get a, a gardener to come in and, and maintain things there. So that's um, that's obviously um, very important. With the whole um, thing about the landlord's insurance that we we're talking about before. Uh, that's obviously another thing that's actually claimed um, on tax as well. For people who are buying uh, a, a property off the plan as part of an investment portfolio, and, and, and probably at the moment it's not something that uh, a lot of people are doing, in my experience anyway. So what they're able to do is obviously depreciate um, the improvements of that property from brand new. For people who are buying existing dwellings that are already established, they're also able to get a quantity surveyor in, which we, we've touched on in a previous episode, uh, whereby uh, you can actually have everything valued in the property and use that as part of a tax depreciation schedule, uh, which has some benefits also. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So that's, um, that, I think that's the thing that a lot of people actually don't realise. In fact, there's about, uh, I was looking at something from the ATO uh, recently, and it's about 75% of Australian property investors who actually don't realise that they can be using a depreciation schedule on their property. So they're actually leaving money on the table there. You can get, get a lot of money back there, uh, a lot of tax back. Uh, so yeah, that's something to to really consider. And it's not just, uh, you know, in brand new properties and things like that. You can actually depreciate a property over a 40-year lifespan. Now, the best part uh, of that depreciation is over the, uh, the first five to 10 years of the property. 
Uh, however, uh, it's still valid up to 40 years. So that's something to, yeah, worthy of noting. Uh, the other thing also, if you end up, say, renovating a property, so even as a, an older property, older than 40 years, but you renovate the property, then you can actually depreciate um, those renovations as well. So that's um, uh, very, uh, you know, that's something that a lot of people probably don't consider. So, you know, certainly get the advice, um, you know, from your accountant and stuff too when you're you know, working in all this into your equation. But there's a lot of things here that are great benefits to yourself as a, as a property investor and can really help your cash flow. Uh, and this comes back to a positively geared property because quite often, uh, you know, people sort of uh, can have a pro positively geared property after tax. Uh, and that es essentially means that it, it may be a bit cash flow negative before uh, their tax return. But uh, but once they uh, claim everything and they've got the depreciation schedule in place, they get a bit of money back. They'll end up having a positively geared property, which is essentially the true meaning of positively geared is it actually is exactly that after it's cash flow po positive after tax. Uh, the ultimate goal is having a cash flow positive property before tax. Uh, that's what we should all be aiming for. But certainly if we can do all these tax deductions and then end up with cash flow positive property and get a good handy tax return, uh, then that's going to really help you out as well. And that's going to uh, help you out as you move towards um, further property purchases because you've got more more money to play with, more equity. Absolutely. And it's once again, it's having a proactive property manager that uh, a lot of the good ones, in my experience, they've they've got contacts in those fields so they can actually help facilitate when you first introduce your property to them, getting the depreciation schedule drawn up, Lloyd. Uh, and obviously everything you've just touched on, you know, it is, is also part of, part of that dream team that we discuss is having a great accountant, which can help you with, uh, you know, making sure that you're at getting every deduction possible and they can give you some further advice around what we've just touched on. Yeah, that's very true, Alex. So I actually think that a quantity surveyor who does the depreciation report uh, should actually be part of your dream team because for each property you buy, you can actually have the one company that then can do a depreciation report no matter where your, your properties are located. Uh, so uh, especially if they've got, uh, you know, obviously different uh, franchises in different different localities and things. One of the good things about a property manager is that they often have the contacts for tradespersons uh, and they, they should have as well. So when you've got a property and it does need some repairs or even potentially some renovations, a good property manager will be able to get the right people in to give quotes and do that work for you. The other important benefit, Lloyd, uh, when appointing a managing agent is that you get the benefit of their experience. So beyond appointing a good tenant, um, you know, having the property well advertised to attract good quality tenants. Uh, and, and, you know, obviously the benefits, you know, we've touched on the taxation benefits, we've touched on the fact that it frees your time up to do other things that can possibly produce you more income to buy more properties, which is always the goal. Um, having a really experienced managing agent comes in a handy if you do on that unlikely event need to go to tenancy tribunal. It's not something you want to be doing as an individual um, in, in terms of putting together a case and, and getting stuck in a sticky situation, is it? No, absolutely not. And and that's really the last resort. And a good property manager will try to find other ways to obviously sort things out. I mean, if you've got a tenant that you're having a bit of a few issues with, then the property manager will try to, to work through those issues. Uh, and whether they're a difficult tenant because they're uh, causing issues in the property or whether they're, they're late paying rent, then the property manager will sort out those kind of things. Uh, going to the tribunal is really the last step. But if you do, you don't want to be the one having to put that case together because that is, um, a, you know, a nightmare really, and and would, would take a lot of your time. So you need someone who's got that experience to do that. A lot of time, those kind of things can actually end up benefiting the tenant more than you as the landlord. So there are better steps that we need to take before we actually get to that, uh, that point. But initially, it really comes back to having the right tenant. But even before that, buying the right property in the right location. And this is where I really stress. Don't just try to buy in sort of the cheapest location thinking you're going to get a really good deal and then you'll end up a less than superb tenant because that can have an on-flow effect. So it really comes back to making sure that you're setting your portfolio up with a, a good asset base of, of residential properties that are going to actually perform well for you. They're not going to perform well if you don't have cash coming out of those properties through good tenants paying you good rent. Absolutely. It's, it's very true. And, and I guess it, it all ties in with, you know, because there are so many moving parts in property investing and property ownership. 
everything sort of ties into one and the other. Once again, you know, we always talk about strategy. It's the same concept really, isn't it? It's having a strategy towards getting the right people in the right place. And then everything from there is a lot easier to build on. Absolutely. And like I always say, it's, it's, it's all about education. So you really need to learn. There's so many moving parts. You really need to learn every everything about uh, what you're doing, but get some, uh, you know, get some advice, get some mentoring, you know, do lots of reading. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why I put out my book, Positively Geared, and tried to cover a lot of these issues in there, just so that people can get some comfort around all that, you know, before they proceed with their, uh, their own purchases, just so they can be sure that on how to make the right decisions. Lloyd, a lot of people uh, are driven by, you know, the decision making is driven by trying to find the, the cheapest, whether it's a selling agent or a managing agent for a property. We, we just really want to reinforce today that it, it, it's important to get the right team behind you. I mean, no, it's no different to a dream team. You wouldn't hire a, a you know, a, a bad accountant just because he's, you know, $200 cheaper for a, for a consultancy session with him. And I think that it's no different with appointing a managing agent. What do you think is a, a fair or reasonable fee in the market today to, to pay for a managing agent in, in Sydney, for example? Okay, so in, in Sydney, I, th I think a probably a pretty fair uh, fee to be paying would probably be around about the 5.5 to 6%. Sure, there's, uh, there's some that are cheaper than that, and there may be some a little bit more expensive than that. So the ones that are a bit more expensive than that, uh, that doesn't actually mean that they're you know, too overpriced because you need to look at that overall package. What do they charge if you go to the tribunal? Most charge, you know, per hour, for example. Uh, what do they charge for putting out statements per month and, and things like that? So some actually have it all inclusive. Others will charge a cheaper per month commission, but then have these extra charges. So you actually need to look at things overall. Agencies that sort of charge, you know, 4% uh, seems very reasonable, but then they're not necessarily going to be the best agents for your property. So you just need to make sure that you do proper due diligence there and uh, and you know, come to an understanding of what, why they're cheap and uh, is it because they've got low overheads? Do they have a mobile office? Yeah, are they really able to manage your property adequately? What I can say is that you know it's very competitive market in Sydney and of course with property prices being higher in Sydney than anywhere else in the country, the percentage is generally a bit lower because the property managers are still going to get good fees out of it. So for example, if you've got investment properties in Brisbane, then uh, you'd be likely to be paying around 8%, so anywhere between 7 to 9%. And that can be the case in, in regional areas as well, such as Newcastle, for example, much higher than what you would pay in, in Sydney. So so you need to sort of look at the uh, the city as an average. But yeah, if you're looking around about uh, between the 5 to 6% uh, and then sort of uh, looking around that, that's a sort of a good ballpark. Lloyd, in your book, Positively Geared, you also refer to uh, smoke alarms as, as an essential part of the landlord toolkit. Yeah, absolutely, Alex. So uh, I just thought, yeah, we could probably briefly touch on that now because uh, it is the responsibility um, of every landlord to ensure that um, you do have smoke alarms, you know, fitted within your property uh, because there is legislation uh, behind that. And it's also important to make sure that you replace the batteries uh, before, uh, you know, any new tenants move in. I think that's very important. There is a couple of points, I guess, to uh, to note that during tenancy, it's actually the tenant's responsibility to to replace um, the batteries. So they've actually got to make sure that the smoke alarms keep working during the time that they're living there. But if your smoke alarm is faulty, then that's actually the responsibility of um, of you as the as the property owner uh, to get it repaired or replaced. So again, that comes back, and that's certainly something you don't want to ignore if your property manager. Uh, calls you and says, uh, we've got a problem with the smoke alarm, can I get it fixed? You should not be delaying that because we know what p possible ramifications that uh, might have. Um, and of course, there are there are plenty of companies around that actually specialise specifically in smoke alarm maintenance. And that's something that your property manager, uh, that they would have a list of those sort of companies and can certainly organise that for you. And that's part of their job. Particularly with insurances, you know, you don't want to put yourself in a position where they come in after the fact and say, okay, well, we've just seen your smoke alarms not working, therefore we're not going to cover you for X, Y, Z. Absolutely. And it's also very important, Alex, that you understand what sort of smoke alarm you've got. So whether it's hardwired or whether it's just battery operated, because that's going to be one of the questions most likely on your insurance application that you're, you're filling out. We hope that everybody listening today has taken away a few really key points in terms of what to look for in a managing agent transitioning from homeowner to landlord and learning all of these key skills. Lloyd, you cover off on a lot of this in much greater detail in your book, Positively Geared. 
Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, uh, in, in my book, uh, we, you know, we just try to cover off in, on everything there just to, to give people as much education as, as possible around, um, you know, buying properties and property investing and, uh, you know, all the different strategies, but certainly with, with landlords is, uh, and, um, you know, property management is, is very important there because once you've got a, um, a property and you're, you're buying a property with the, with the strategy to create income from it, create cash flow from it, then actually having it managed correctly and bring in that rent is actually just as important as the property acquisition itself. So that's actually a very important uh, aspect to to be looking at there. And I and I hope everybody can can really consider the things that uh, we've spoken about today, uh, both for their future purchases and also for any of the the properties that they currently got. And it might be a good time for people to start reviewing where they currently are. Uh, and yeah, whether they need to uh, have a look at their current property managers and what their properties are doing at the moment. Thanks so much for your time, Lloyd. Thanks, Alex. Thanks.